Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's web conference, Three Key Factors Driving Effective ETHI Monitoring, brought to you by HIMSS and Nitro Security. My name is Chip Means, and I'll serve as your moderator today. Before we get started, I'd like to give you a few instructions regarding the Q&A process. If you'd like to ask our speakers a question during the presentation, please type it into the box and submit it at any time. Please make sure your questions are submitted to all panelists in the Q&A section. Questions will be facilitated at the end of today's presentation. All attendees of today's presentation are placed in listen-only mode. There is no need to mute your line during the presentation. For technical assistance during today's call, please send me a private message by selecting host in your chat area. And finally, a full archive of this presentation will be available at a later date. You can visit nitrosecurity.com slash webcast to access a PDF of these slides. There will also be a poll at the end of today's presentation. We'd like you to uh, share your feedback on that event, on that poll if you could. And now I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Mac McMillan, CEO of Synergist Tech and Chairman of HIMSS Privacy and Security Steering Committee, and Mel Shakir, CTO of Nitro Security. Michael Mac McMillan is co-founder and CEO of Synergist Tech Incorporated, a firm specializing in areas of information security and regulatory compliance in the healthcare sector. Mr. McMillan brings over 30 years of combined intelligence, risk management, and security consulting experience. His philosophy for security is grounded in understanding the complicated nexus between people, processes, and technology. He is focused on developing appropriate solutions based on business purpose and knowledge and a common sense application of technology and control. He has worked in the healthcare industry since his retirement from the federal government in 2000 and has contributed to HFMA, HCCA, AHIA, AHIMA, and HIMSS. He is the former chair of HIMSS Information Security Working Group. Mel Shakir serves in the office of the CTO at Nitro Security, where he brings over 15 years of experience in software development and management, information security, and database technology. He is responsible for developing and implementing Nitro Security's overall technology vision and roadmap, including next generation application and database security management solutions. Previously, Mel architected and developed advanced database security solutions as CTO of Ripple Tech, which was acquired by Nitro Security in 2008. He founded InCash in 2004, where he served as CTO. InCash was acquired by Ripple Tech. And now I'll hand it over to Mac and Mel, who will begin today's presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. And it's a pleasure to be here with uh, Nitro Security and, and HIMSS to uh, talk about uh, this particular topic, which I think is a very important one uh, and a very timely one, <coughs> given a lot of the uh, new rules that are coming out uh, under high tech, which are putting more emphasis on being able to know exactly what's going on in our environments. Just a very brief uh, addition to what has already been presented with respect to Synergist Tech, where I come from. Um, bottom, bottom line, Synergist Tech is focused in information security, as, as was said, but more importantly, it's focused in healthcare. Uh, and one of the big, big uh, parts of our, our, our corporate structure or our corporate philosophy is around uh, thought leadership and participating not only uh, in, in the industry, uh, but also participating uh, with other organizations in the industry to bring more information around privacy and security uh, to the folks uh, who need it. So any opportunity for us to, to support an effort such as this is always a, a welcome uh, opportunity. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it back to Mel and let him talk about uh, Nitro Security. Thank you very much, Mac. And I'll be very brief. Uh, you know, Nitro Security uh, has offices. We are based out of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and uh, we have over 500 customers today. Uh, one of the ways in which we differentiate ourselves in the marketplace is we bring all the primary security monitoring technologies, uh, which is SIEM, which stands for Security Information and Event Management, Log Management, Database Activity Monitoring, Content Leak Monitoring, IPS, into one fully integrated solution suite. Uh, we have had an exceedingly good uh, run, both revenue-wise uh, as well as technology recognition and awards. And right now, we hold the number one spot in the recent InfoWorld report on all log management vendors. Uh, SC Magazine rated us as the top 20 products of all times in 2009. And last December, they created a special category called the Innovators Hall of Fame, where we were the only SIM and log management vendor. 
Uh, here is a list of uh, some of our healthcare customers, uh, which include some big names. Uh, Health and Human Services is one of our customers as well, uh, FDA. There are large and mid-sized hospitals, uh, Catholic Health West, uh, 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 Roswell Park Cancer Institute, just to name a few. Uh, and that's all the introduction I'd like to give about the company. Uh, let's move on to the content. So I'll pass it back to you, Mac. Okay, thank you, Mel. Well, I'm going to kind of give an intro here uh, to this topic and really talk about why it's important, uh, why it's necessary for us to monitor what goes on uh, in our environment and really uh, try to save as much time as possible for Mel to talk about the real exciting things uh, that they're doing at Nitro Security to make this easier uh, and more manageable for people to accomplish, uh, which is really the most important thing. So why is it required? Well, it's really simple. We have regulatory requirements out there today uh, on the books that say that we are responsible for conducting activity reviews with respect to what's going on in our environment and conducting ongoing auditing of controls, security controls. Um, in most environments today where we're dealing with literally hundreds of applications, thousands of systems, thousands of users, uh, and the creation of millions of logs in a given day, um, it's, it's very uh, uh, demanding and almost impossible to try to do that anymore in a manual way. Uh, we have to use technology to give us the ability to have the awareness that we need to understand what users are doing, what people with elevated privileges are doing in terms of managing controls, uh, and just what's going on in our environment in a more near real-time uh, perspective uh, so that we can maybe mitigate some of the, the negative impacts uh, of things that just happen uh, in the environment, not, a lot, not, not to mention the things that may happen uh, maliciously or deliberately as a result of somebody doing something uh, that they shouldn't. But in, in addition to the basic requirements that's out there that HIPAA established, we also have some new, new requirements out there that have been established. And I think everybody understands the interim final rule on breach notification, but obviously that rule made, made it really important for us to be able to very quickly drill down into a particular incident and try to identify exactly what has happened and who is involved and who saw what uh, so that we can respond not only to the notification requirements under the rule, uh, but also to do that risk assessment in terms of what it is we need to do and be aware of and what it is we need to address to make sure that that incident uh, doesn't occur again. When you look at look into the next year, last year, you know, the final rules on meaningful use and EHR certification criteria uh, came out. And those, those rules actually made it mandatory that systems certified as electronic health records have the necessary functionality to create that accurate audit trail of access to patient information. And that Rule 14 for uh, under meaningful use for hospitals and Rule 15 uh, under the, uh, within meaningful use for small providers basically makes it, makes it necessary for us to conduct a risk assessment around that EHR and to remediate anything that we find. So for instance, one of the things that, that that EHR today is supposed to provide is the ability to create that audit log and to be able to view it. Uh, and we have a responsibility not only to, to implement that functionality, but to have a process around it that demonstrates that we can actually do that as a meaningful user. In 2011, and just around the corner, I think we all know that we're going to have accounting for disclosures come out. Uh, that rule went to the Office of, the office of Management and Budget almost a month ago now. Uh, at that time, they were projecting that that rule would come out within 60 to 90 days uh, of that event. So we're probably looking at 30 to 60 days now. Um, and that particular rule is going to provide even more specificity around exactly what's needed in terms of monitoring of access to patient information by individuals, not only in, in our healthcare organization directly, but also that we share that information with. So it's going to become more and more critical that organizations have the ability and very quickly to identify what has gone on with with patient information, who has viewed it, who has seen it, what has, what has happened to it, um, and be able to report that or deal with it appropriately. So again, why is it necessary? Well, 
it's simple. There's real threats out there. We all know that the insider abuse issue is still prevalent in healthcare. We still have users who are looking at information that they shouldn't or taking information that they shouldn't have access to or in some cases, unfortunately, actually stealing uh, information and using it for, for instance, identity theft purposes or medical theft purposes. It's not things we like to think about, not things we like to talk about necessarily, but certainly things that we know go on. The loss of data in systems. We still lose systems. Um, we still have systems that are stolen. Uh, we still have systems that are accessed inappropriately, and, and it happens all the time. We have persistent malicious attacks out there. If you read the latest uh, survey that was done by Symantec, uh, you'd know that the number of, of malicious attacks uh, over the last few years have increased exponentially. Um, and all of these threats have real consequences or our healthcare organizations who are unfortunate enough to experience one. Add to that the overly complex environment that I talked about earlier with, with those hundreds of app, apps and, uh, and thousands of users and systems, and again, we, we realize that the old process of manually auditing what's going on in our system or what users are doing that focuses on key uh, personalities or, or particular individuals is just not adequate to address the, the new requirements under HIPAA and under high tech, um, and quite frankly are just uh, not uh, possible uh, when, you, when you consider all of the information that's, that's generated in a, in a given day in most environments. Add to that, that stepped up regulatory requirement that I talked about a second ago as well, with very specific accountable accountabilities for access uh, and sharpened enforcement mechanisms, which we're, I'm going to talk about here shortly as well. Um, and there are accountability uh, issues with, with real costs associated. So there's real threat, threats, it's not easy to do, and there's real costs associated uh, with, this, with this requirement. And that's that comment that you see posted there at the bottom by, by Valerie Morgan Austin, who is, which is a new position at OCR, uh, came from a from a interview she did with respect to HHS's current plans to train uh, state attorney generals to be able to carry out their enforcement responsibilities as it relates to HIPAA and high tech. Obviously, as you know, uh, OCR just recently began levying fines. Uh, for some time now, they have been conducting uh, compliance reviews of, of those organizations that have suffered a major breach, uh, and they have been using uh, resolution agreements and compliance action plans to, to resolve some of those issues. But now they've actually begun to issue fines, and those fines that they've issued, which we'll talk about in a second, are not insignificant. If there's any doubt, you know, these are just a few of the events that are out there. I think everybody knows last year that we finally had the first person sentenced uh, under under HIPAA, uh, UCLA physician, uh, who was sentenced to four months uh, in jail uh, for uh, snooping at patients' information. Um, it, it, the bottom line is we all know that this goes on, and, and, it's, and it's just in the number of breaches uh, that have occurred uh, since enforcement began um, and the number of, of cases that have been reported is just putting more and more of a spotlight on the fact that we need, we need to do a better job of controlling our data and at the same time knowing what's going on in our environment uh, to try to stem some of this as well as the negative effects from it. But how do we do that? Well. You know, you're going to hear Mel talk a lot about this content-aware decision support um, uh, idea, and it really is true. I mean, when you look at at uh, the log information that is produced on any given day from, from our systems, and, and if you have the ability to collect that information and to analyze it and to correlate it across multiple platforms, it can produce an enormous amount of real-time intelligence that can help us with uh, making decisions. And high tech basically has fundamentally changed you know, our security paradigm um, and made this really a requirement. Um, as I said before, both HIPAA and high tech speak to auditing and monitoring uh, as part of that risk management process. Um, 
what high tech expects us to do in in, in, uh, simple, in simple terms is know where our PHI is created, where it's processed, how it's stored, where it's stored, where it's transmitted, where it's shared, and with whom and by whom. Um, the ability to make this content aware decision uh, with respect to security controls and processes, meaning knowing when a security control is is enabled or disabled, for instance, automatic log off. Uh, we all know that there's a requirement to have that, especially in, in, in our environment where we have PHI. It's a requirement for meaningful use with our EHR. The ability to know when that when that control has been tampered with or disabled uh, is very important. The compliance issue. Okay. Um, <laughs> And we want to be able to do this in a reasonable time period. We want to be able to answer these questions quickly. We want to be able to respond not only to requests from patients uh, with respect to access to their information, but we also want to be able to respond quickly to our internal customers in terms of what has gone on, what has happened, what is it we need to do, what is it we need to address, um, so that we can do that very quickly, very effectively, and, res and, and, and appear as responsible uh, as we want to. Um, Again, what has experience taught us? That collecting this, this information, creating this intelligence from our log, uh, log environment um, is a powerful security tool. It absolutely is. If I can harness that information, if I can distill it down to something that is, that is relevant and is timely and that can help me make those decisions, I can really avoid some of the issues that, that, I'm, that are out there. And if nothing else, I can at least mitigate them uh, so that their impact is not near uh, as as dramatic as it might be. And by correctly in that, I mean actively monitoring our network, actively collecting those logs from our system environment, actively having a process that looks at those looks at that information, distills it, correlates it with other information, produces meaningful reports and alerts that management can take action on. How has high tech changed the game? It's really clarified some of the, uh, the HIPAA rules uh, with respect to privacy and security and audit and, and accountability. Um, but it's also addressed the business associate uh, issue as well as subcontractors. And this is going to become more of an issue as we start looking at things like accountability, uh, uh, or excuse me, accounting for disclosures. Um, and other requirements in terms of knowing exactly what's going on, not just with the information we have in-house, but with the information that we're actually sharing uh, with others. Uh, it's updated, as I said, those privacy and security requirements. We've talked about at least three of those. There are going to be more uh, coming down the road uh, that I believe will have uh, some aspect of accountability as it relates to access and, and, and activity uh, that, are, that are also going to going to make this even more important. Uh, the standards for electronic health records, everybody is in the process now of, of implementing their EHR if they haven't implemented their EHR or EMR already. Um, and, and as I said, there are, there's, there's requirements uh, as part of that implementation that we need to address. Um, and this is a tool that very, very um, much will assist us in making sure that those controls are, are in place, functional, operating properly, and, and, and there when we need them. Um, and last but not least, those enhanced enforcement and penalty issues that I talked about um, are definitely out there, and I think everybody's aware of that. And how is OCR uh, approaching their enforcement responsibilities? Well, first of all, I think, I think the word that everybody needs to understand or take away is that they're very serious about what they do, whether, you, whether you've heard or seen uh, Ms. Verdugo speak uh, or Ms. McAndrew speak, um, you know, the bottom line is uh, they, they've said from the very beginning they intend to carry out their responsibilities, they intend to uh, investigate properly uh, and, and to evaluate compliance, um, and they intend to hold people accountable uh, for their actions. Um, they have, however, chartered a course that's aimed at promoting compliance, which is a very responsible way of approaching it. They're not necessarily looking to, to establish or to, to uh, levy fines. As you all know, there's been well over 200 
uh, some odd uh, major breaches uh, since last year, uh, and there have only been, at, at the moment at least, uh, two fines levied. So they're not out there uh, uh, fine happy, if you will, looking to find people uh, unnecessarily. Um, what they're really interested in is people doing a good job protecting the data and being responsible in how they do that and addressing whatever the weakness was or whatever the issue was that allowed the breach to uh, happen. Um, but the high tech specifically directs HHS and the Office of, of Civil Rights uh, to conduct those compliance audits whenever there's a major breach. Uh, as well as to conduct routine uh, compliance audits, which might uh, begin sometime uh, this year. Um, those incident-based investigations, as I said, have climbed now to, to over, well over 250 uh, OCR uh, um, uh, request has requested a 10% increase in its budget for enforcement. They just did that a couple of weeks ago. Um, HHS uh, just began levying their first fines. As you know, Signet Health uh, was hit with a $4.3 million uh, dollar fine. The interesting thing, or I guess the lesson to take away from that particular incident, was that Signet Health was, it was basically hit with two separate fines. The first one was for the incident. The second one was for non-cooperation or non-compliance with the government's investigation. Real important, real important. Uh, they are serious, as I said, about about their responsibilities. And then, secondly, we know all know that Massachusetts General uh, received uh, the second fine in that same week, uh, um, and and but they they were uh, they actually cooperated, and in addition to their fine, they were also given a resolution agreement um, to fix the things that were identified in the government's investigation in 2011. OCR initiates training for, for the state attorney generals, as I mentioned earlier. And that training is going to happen in the May and June time frame, and so everybody is expecting that there will be an upturn in, in uh, enforcement activity uh, after that, so the latter part of this year. Some of the frequently expressed themes that at least I hear around, around the industry as it relates to uh, this audit and log uh, requirement is that log data collected each year, you know, we all know it grows 15 to 20 percent each year, um, which just makes it harder and harder uh, for us to get our hands around. Um, the current reactive manual processes are time, time consuming and ineffective. And I think most CIOs out there, most IT directors out there, um, have had to deal with having either one or two members of their staff pulled away for some compliance investigation. Uh, or some legal investigation to, to, to go do manual review of log information to try to help them understand what has happened. It is incredibly time consuming uh, and in, in, many, in many cases uh, it's, not, it's ineffective and it's incomplete. Um, just due to the sheer volume of logs, as I said, there's a lack of confidence in that manual process by most people. They, they, they know they're not getting it all or may not be seeing it all. Um, there's a real desire to mitigate potential public embarrassment. And a lot of that comes back to just how quickly they can answer those questions and respond effectively and, and, and appear to be in control of what's going on and knowledgeable. Um, many systems ac applications currently lack the necessary audit log functionality, um, which is a fact. And, it, and it's one of the things that, that the industry probably will have the most impact on going forward. One of the nice things about the EHR certification process is that the, is that that rule basically forces the vendor to provide the functionality that's necessary to get the job done. It would be it would be very nice, in my opinion, if all systems that healthcare organizations uh, purchased had to meet at least some minimal requirement uh, to provide the functionality that IT needs to be able to do the job properly. Uh, that would absolutely uh, simplify their their environment. Um, and there used to be a, a gap in the current SIM log management solutions to address clinical applications. And Mel's going to talk about that today. Most of the SIMs today, and in particular uh, Nitro Security, uh, have found a way to bridge this gap between the network log environment and the application log environment by partnering with 
other solutions out there, such as Fair Warning, who does that healthcare application privacy monitoring piece and is able to provide those events, that those event uh, logs, if you will, or, or uh, to the Nitro SIM, which can then correlate that information against the network uh, events that they're seeing and make and produce a more complete picture of what has gone on with respect to a particular user or a particular incident. And that is extremely powerful when we can when we can put that information together and get a more integrated single view of what's going on in our environment. Last but not least, that, that really speaks to this issue of correlation. Uh, and that correlation is what enables proactive monitoring and really provides the power to that IT director or that compliance officer or that CIO who's trying to answer those questions with respect to what went on, when, where, and with whom. Um, it provides for things like content and behavior-based modeling decisions, meaning I can define certain circumstances or scenarios around users and their workflow uh, that enable me to create rules that would say when these pieces of information all collide, if you will, um, I know I have a situation that I need to report on or I need to alert on. Uh, it incre increases the efficiency in our investigative process because now instead of instead of manually going through logs and trying to connect the dots, I've got a system that is actually taking those log events based on particular rules and the parsing and indexing that it's been able to do, connect those dots very quickly and, and reduce that, that analytical process in many cases uh, tenfold. Multiple reports, sources increases the confidence of decisions. But when I start to enable the automated uh, logging process and I, and I know that I have all of the log data coming from all of my systems that are out there that I care about, um, I now know that I'm actually seeing everything or seeing more than I might have seen trying to do this manually, and, and I'm not worried about the fact that somebody might have missed something, and I get a more accurate uh, uh, picture, which, which gives me more confidence in what I'm saying. It assists in identifying false alarms. Because it's more accurate, because there's more information, because this correlation occurs, uh, I can I can begin to recognize when something is not an incident just as easily as I can recognize when something is. Uh, missing data is not is not looked at as as, as, as much of a limiting uh, factor because again, I, I'm not worried about the fact that I've missed something. Uh, I'm actually seeing it in, in real time. Um, and it creates a more thorough understanding of exactly what happened. When I can take the events uh, from multiple systems, multiple platforms, from both the network and the application side, and I can begin to connect the dots from when somebody came into the building, logged into their system, logged into the network, logged into the application, looked at whatever they looked at, et cetera. Um, I can begin to see a much clearer picture of exactly what happened and how it happened and what the timelines were. Um, and it per per permits, with all of this data, it permits me to do much, much more granular statistical or historical or pattern or rule-based and behavioral-based analysis than I could ever hope to do uh, looking at logs uh, manually. Um, but more importantly, I, I think, is the ability to actually get ahead of things to be able to recognize when something is happening in my environment early enough to recognize that there's a problem without allowing it to become a major breach, if you will. Um, and then finally, being able to have automated reporting and alerting that is coming to me all the time when things are occurring, as opposed to when somebody finally uh, complains about something or see something and I'm in a more reactive mode and the information is old um, and much harder uh, to follow up on. So with that, Mel, hopefully I've laid the groundwork for you to talk about uh, your solution and what, how you answer these problems. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Mac. Uh, what we are going to do now is uh, we're going to reinforce everything that Mac just said in the form of use cases 
uh, so that you can justify the deployment of appropriate tools and technologies within your environment. Uh, so the way I've laid out the slides, uh, it walks us through the use cases, and after each use case, it showcases some screenshots of the solution of how we would solve, help you solve that specific use case. So I'd like to start with, first and foremost, uh, I think a lot of the crux of the message that Mac just pointed out was with respect to fast and accurate privacy breach investigations. That when things happen, you need to be able to get to the information fast. So the first and foremost thing, of course, is that you have to have collected that information. If you didn't, you really don't have any place to go look for that information. And in a lot of cases, we find that the information is out there, but it's not in the form that can be rapidly searched and assessed quickly. Uh, now, the breach notification rule, for example, section 13402, it is fairly clear that you know, if you have a breach, you're going to be up on the HHS website. And there's a little screenshot uh, at the bottom right which shows the list of organizations that are up there on the website who have had breaches. And we all know that it gets far worse that if you have more than 500 individuals' data is breached, then you have to report to prominent media. So the whole idea of being able to do an accurate and quick damage assessment, how many records were breached, which files were touched, with forensic level granularity so that you can get to the specific session details, I think is very crucial. So here's one screenshot, uh, you know, which emphasizes the fact of why the session trails are important. So here you can see a person logging in, for example. And he does a whole lot of activity in, this, in, in, in a specific system or many systems until he logs off. And as part of the session, now you are able to identify that that person did access 33 patient records. So this is, this is part of the damage assessment process where the data is available and through the tools and technology that can be presented quickly and efficiently. Here's another example where, you know, some of the data leaked from the organization. Now, it could be EPHI data, it could be credit information, or anything that is valuable. And in this example, uh, we are trying to get, you know, the system helps us identify that some data had leaked within the organization. Uh, we can say that for sure, and we have the information to back it up, who sent it to whom, what was contained within the files that had the sensitive data. Here's another very important use case. Um, I think, and this, this really comes down to managing the costs. So when you deploy the right tools and technologies, the end benefit is savings. And what you can expect more and more is costs associated with ongoing reporting, and especially ad hoc reporting. Patient-driven investigations, accounting of disclosures, business associate reporting, all of this is essentially reporting. Okay, and the HIPAA privacy rule makes it fairly clear that patients have the right to request and obtain a copy of their health records and to request uh, corrections to it, right? Uh, so you have to be prepared for this ongoing cost and have a plan to manage this cost. Uh, the second part of the reporting is really the HIPAA privacy reporting, uh, you know, the integration that uh, Mac alluded to uh, with other tools and technologies that provide some information context around healthcare specific use cases. Uh, we pretty much integrate uh, products like Fair Warning into our system. Uh, uh, the other part of it is a lot of the hospitals, uh, they have hundreds and thousands of different kinds of applications that are in use, and a lot of them are custom applications developed internally. Uh, and these are within scope. And you have to have a plan to be able to log that information and bring it into the system quickly. So again, here are a few screenshots uh, you know, that uh, that will talk to how we help you quickly get to the reporting information. So for example, uh, in Nitro View, there's a whole list of HIPAA reports, like the views and dashboards. So it's not just reports that you have to print out, uh, binders of them, but even interactive ones where you have access to a dashboard, you can move around, drill down quickly for information that you need to present to auditors or for your own investigation. Okay. Now here's another example of a HIPAA privacy dashboard. Now this dashboard is specifically targeted to the folks within the organization 
who have privacy responsibilities, okay, not the SOC responsibilities. And it focuses on high-level information that's reported back that here we have a notification that a deceased patient's record was accessed or somebody is snooping on the VIP records, et cetera. Okay. Here's another example of a custom EMR application. Now, this is, this is really neat because you can bring in the subject matter experts, you know, the ones that know and understand the applications, to help collaborate and improve the security of the organization. So in this case, only the specific view for that specific patient records application, okay, this happens to be an EMR application, is presented to the subject matter experts where all the other noise and all the other information collected in your environment is completely removed from because that's not his role or responsibility. Okay? And here he is able to assist. Uh, he's able to identify access denied attempts very easily because he knows and understands his system much better sometimes than even the security professionals. The next set of use cases are around risk management, really. So it, it comes down to the fact that you should be monitoring what is more important. Okay? And you should be able to utilize the metadata, the metrics uh, that are available uh, to be able to find anomalies. Uh, a simple example, uh, Mac already pointed that out, that you know, uh, if someone's in the organization, uh, well, the system has recorded that. And some, if someone is using the identity of that individual and the system has not recorded a log on before that, we should know about that. So in this case, Dr. Bernard happens to have signed on to a system, but he, our logs show us that he never even entered the building. So this kind of correlation you should start doing within the organization, and it directly relates back to the HIPAA security rules, which require us to put appropriate administrative and physical technical uh, safeguards in the organization. The other part of this use case is the you know, identification of rogue devices and vulnerable applications. So with the proliferation, of, especially of the mobile devices, uh, we know that there's a big threat out there. Uh, you know, we are granting our physicians and nurses the ability to use this new generation technologies and access your systems. But you have to have the appropriate logging in place because these devices can be breached, they can be lost, uh, and, your app, and your systems can be compromised as a result of that. Uh, the other part is that with your applications, when you buy from vendors, there are vulnerabilities that come along with it. For example, you know, there may be an embedded database server with an application. Almost every application has a backend database. And when those applications are vulnerable, uh, you need to know about it. Okay? So all of this information has to come together in a single system so that you can report upon it, find it, and nail it. And here, again, are some screenshots that will help you identify some of those use cases. So in, in this specific use case, uh, we are looking at shared usage of accounts. Well, it's very typical in, a, in, a, in case of a breach where somebody's account has been taken over and now it's being used from a different location. And a system like NitroView would help you easily identify that a shared account is being used, the same user has signed on from two different places in a short period of time. Here's another dashboard. And this dashboard essentially is coming back and telling you, and it's not looking at a specific event, but it's taking into consideration a lot of different events that are taking place and highlighting some of the uh, patterns, if you may. Uh, so for example, you know, if there is a successful brute force attempt, what is the pattern that you expect to see? Well, there are going to be some fail logins because the user has to break in the password and then he finally succeeds. So that is a pattern. If there's a SQL injection attack, you're going to see some failed queries then there's going to be a successful one. So that's a pattern. And this dashboard, uh, you know, which comes prepared with lots of different correlation rules, looks for these patterns. Okay. The next one, uh, you know, this is actually a dashboard from one of our customers uh, who took the time and effort to use the tools and technologies correctly. And by that, what I mean is he classified the information that's in an organization, the sensitive information, it could be your patient records, uh, you know, what is critical and what is not critical. Uh, by, you know, going through that exercise up front, he is now able to focus very clearly on, you know, who are the high-risk users and what is the high-risk activity they are doing against the highly sensitive data. 
Here's another example where all the information of all the devices that are connecting your environment are in the system, in a central place where they can be monitored, and the vulnerabilities that are associated with them, which means that these are the devices that have not been appropriately patched and they could be prone to an attack, uh, are being highlighted. And this is necessary because if you want the tool to raise the criticality uh, of an attack on a system that's vulnerable, uh, you want to do that, uh, and you want the system to do that. Okay. Now, here are a few other use cases uh, around content awareness. Okay. Uh, so it's well and good to monitor logs. Okay. You have routers, firewalls, switches, IDS, and some of these things already deployed. You're probably bringing in logs of uh, uh, your operating systems and some of your servers, but there's a lot of other things that are going on that you are completely blind to. Uh, for example, you know, do you know who's using uh, your computers right now uh, to do a Facebook post? Who is sending instant messages? Is there any malware going on? Is there any P2P file sharing going on? Uh, well, you may come back and say that our security policy denies P2P file sharing uh, or denies us hosting a web server. But the fact of the matter is that there, your systems may be compromised and you may not even know about it. So when there's an illegal web server which is part of a botnet and it's trying to do a command and control back to the command and control station, it is going to behave as a web server just for that very instant. And the very single time it behaves as a web server, you need to be able to capture that information so that you can identify that there is a, uh, you know, that you have a problem. Okay, the same is true with P2P file sharing, which is very common with malware. And if you're monitoring all the activity, not just the logs, but even doing the content monitoring, which means the deep packet inspection of what goes on in your environment, that can help you identify and fix the problems. Okay. Uh, now, the things, you know, we try to make uh, your life simple uh, with our tools and technologies. Uh, that's what they're here for. Uh, so things like, you know, dictionaries, which have the uh, ICD-9 codes built in, so that you can build rules around, uh, you know, uh, or you can build better controls around for your highly regulated illnesses like HIV or substance abuse or, or mental illnesses. So you can create some specific rules around that for better controls. And you can also utilize these tools and technologies to discover a lot of other things. For example, if there are unnecessary roles and privileges around uh, that people should not be having, okay, so that they have only access to the data that they need to, these tools and technologies can help you with that as well. Okay, now I actually want to walk you through a, you know, what a privacy breach investigation looks like, okay? and, and how, you know, what are the different roles of the, you know, you know, various people who are all mandated by the same regulation. So the privacy team, of course, uh, you know, will come back and it's doing some reporting on the snooping behaviors or, you know, other suspicious activity, people snooping into other people's data, um, but that almost always. Uh, leads into a security kind of investigation. And almost always, the privacy teams are kind of unprepared for that part of it. Okay. Now, in this example, uh, you know, what we are, what, what is being reported back from an EMR application log, you know, like Cerner or McKesson or Epic or all scripts, whatever you may have, uh, it's reporting back that there's some unusual activity happening from this IP address. And it probably lets you drill down to a level that it says that well, Catherine Holmberg. Catherine Holmberg, the nurse, she's snooping, she's snooping into a lot of patient records. Okay? That appears to be pretty clear from the application logs. But can you really implicate her? Is Catherine Holmberg really guilty? Well, when you actually start your investigation, now, uh, you know, uh, in this form of screenshots, we are, we are trying to figure out, uh, using NitroView, uh, what else is happening from that suspect access point. And when you start looking at this information, in this case, we are doing a flow analysis, which is typical of a security team. Uh, they're seeing a lot of activity associated with their IP address, okay? uh, which seems pretty unusual for a nurse's workstation. And as you start digging deeper, you're starting to see other patterns. Okay? You're, you're starting to see direct database access, which is atypical. You're also starting to see the event correlation dashboard pointing you to kinds of activities that are not normal for a nurse. It doesn't really fit a profile. And as you dig further, you're starting to see that somebody's trying to delete records from the patient system where patient ID is 1,000, 
Okay? And the access has been denied, so that is good. And as you still dig bigger and you start getting into the session details, you're finding that, well, you are lucky that they didn't delete the data, but they were but the person was successful in retrieving 33 patient records. Okay? So now you have confirmed the PCI leak, uh, I mean the EPHI leak. You're also confirming a PCI leak because you can see that, well, there was an email sent with an attachment called my bonus uh, from this person to that person, uh, which had a file that contained credit card numbers. Okay, so once the summary of this, these screenshots, was what you thought was Catherine Holmberg snooping on activity. You were almost ready to implicate her, but it turns out that her account was actually taken over. Okay, and if you don't bring in information, all your sources, all the infrastructure, not just your EMR application, you don't have the full picture. You, in fact, don't have the information to go back and accuse anybody. You shouldn't be accusing anybody. Uh, now, how do we how do we help you get all this information? You know, what are the tools um, uh, at the device level that we provide? I'll quickly run through that uh, before we get into concluding remarks. So, at the heart of it all is the NitroView ESM or the Enterprise Security Manager, which is our SIM technology. And a basic component of the SIM is the receiver, which brings in information from all the logs that you already have. So, your IDS is an IPS is in your applications. It brings in all that information. Another core component of the ESM is the long-term compliant log management. So as part of HIPAA, you need to be able to save the original logs to, to demonstrate the chain of custody. Uh, and this is a feature which is built into the SIM. Now, if you're a larger organization, you know, these devices can be split up, uh, and you can have multiple of these devices. If you already have an infrastructure where you have cheap NAS or SAN or CIFS, you can utilize that with your long, for your long-term archiving as well. Now, one of the things that we talked about earlier, you know, the content awareness, you know, being able to do a deep packet inspection to see what else is going on over and beyond the logs is also part of the solution. Uh, so, for example, almost every healthcare application has a database behind it, and you can monitor the query and even the response. So if the response contains patient information and it exceeds a certain threshold, uh, you know, the SIM tool can now alert you on that, okay? Uh, you can do the same with the application. So whether there is any inappropriate communication happening through chat sessions or Facebook posts or, you know, Twitter or whatever it may be, that can all be monitored as part of the SIM solution as well. And the last item that we provide as part of this integrated suite is the NITRIVIEW IPS, which can block malware, tri uh, viruses, and trojans. And this is a product that is usually deployed at the perimeter uh, of your organization. So all of these technologies are tightly integrated. So if you think about a Bose system, you know, where you go to one vendor, which, is, which has a, everything that you need, the receiver, the, uh, the amplifiers, the, uh, the equalizers, the DVD, all of it, everything that's necessary for you, it's all integrated together. Okay. Uh, with this, uh, I'm actually going to skip this slide uh, and go to pass it over to uh, Mac for the sake of time for his concluding remarks. Okay, thank you, Mel. Well, just to kind of bring it all full circle, I think the, the, the points that I'd like to, for everybody to take away is that we have some real uh, risks out there, some real threats out there, as we all know, that we're dealing with. We have folks inside our organizations uh, that do things every day uh, that we wish they wouldn't, uh, both accidentally uh, or, or unintentionally as well as, as maliciously. Uh, we have theft of confidential information as it relates to identity theft or medical identity theft. And, of course, with medical identity theft, I mean, we're all more concerned about that, not only from the fraud aspect of it, which is the preponderance of, of medical identity theft today, but also from the patient safety aspect of it, because nobody wants to treat a patient when they're using somebody else's information to represent themselves. Uh, we all know what the outcome of that could be. Um, and, and the identity theft fraud issue is, is always out there and unfortunately it is going to be with us. Um, and last but not least, the advanced uh, persistent threat uh, in terms of malicious uh, software uh, and, and hack, hacking, um, it, it, is, it is still there, it's still alive and well, and unfortunately it's, it's growing, as I said earlier, at an exponential rate. Um, so there's lots of things out there that, that are affecting us and affecting 
affecting our environment and affecting our information and making it more and more important to be able to understand in, in real time uh, what's going on um, and, how, and how best to address it and where the threat could be coming from uh, and what we need to do to uh, mitigate it. And to do that, we really need to monitor our entire environment. We can't just monitor a little bit of it anymore. Uh, we have information that is moving in all directions, as everybody knows. We have information that is out there in our application environment, in our structured files. We have information that is out there in our unstructured environment, spread out over countless data databases, Excel spreadsheets, things that go out in, in Word documents, attachments to documents. We have people sending chats. We have folks posting things to social media. Um, there's video. There's images. There's database queries that are going on from people with elevated privileges or DBAs um, who are accessing the database directly and not using the access control provisions of the application itself, uh, which essentially, as we all know, is a way of getting around that. Um, and all of that activity, at the end of the day, basically adds up to a threat environment that is very complex, very complicated, very active, very dynamic. And, and requires that we have systems that are helping us to monitor uh, what's going on in, in, in our environment in real time. To do that, we really need that correlation engine that that SIM uh, product, if you will, or that SIM class of system provides to us. The ability to take inputs, active inputs, from all directions and from all systems both network-based as well as application-based, and to be able to evaluate those things against known uh, threat profiles, known uh, uh, behavioral rules, known compliance requirements, et cetera, and create reports and alerts that come to us the minute those things occur or in a, in a timely enough fashion that we can address them uh, quickly and responsibly and hopefully avoid a negative impact. And last but not least, <laughs> this all supports uh, continuous, what we call continuous compliance. Um, we're not going up and down. We're not finding things through an annual audit or a periodic audit uh, and not knowing what's going on in between. We actually are creating a baseline of what is normal and what should be happening, and we're managing to deviations in that baseline as opposed to point in time assessments, which can be very misleading in terms of what goes on between those assessments. So this is really one of those things that, that where when you look at when you look at the auditing requirements that are associated with, with HIPAA and associated with high tech, uh, when you look at the information awareness requirements that organizations have today to be able to react to events in their environment in a timely fashion to avoid uh, negative outcomes. Uh, this continuous monitoring is absolutely necessary, and the only way to achieve that is through automating this log management process and the ability to look at it in a, in a single view, which is what SIM uh, basically gives us the capability to do. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our moderator for questions uh, from Mel and I to uh, answer. Great. Thanks, gentlemen, for the presentation. As we roll into the q and I just want to remind all of our attendees, you can access a PDF of all of today's slides at nitrosecurity.com slash webcast. And we will be sending out an archive of this event in an email in the next few business days. And uh, when you submit your questions, uh, please make sure you, you uh, send them to all panelists and look for the exit survey that's going to appear on the right side of the presentation window here at the end. And so with that, um, we have a few minutes before the top of the hour, and one of our first questions here, we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, we know that EMRs will need to be certified to achieve meaningful use. Will any of the wrappers to these systems beyond the application or module itself, such as the security, audit logs, and DLP, require certification in stage one and in the future? Let me, let me uh, handle that. In fact, uh, that's, a, that's a very interesting question, uh, and it's a very timely question, and I think David Finn asked that question, um, so I want to thank him for that. Um, and it's one that I've, I've just recently been dealing with um, on the Privacy and Security Committee 
uh, as it relates to some of the EHR certifications that have been uh, done with uh, in a, as a single platform as opposed to in a modular fashion. Um, interestingly enough, those technologies as it relates to uh, stage one are not required uh, to be certified. Um, they can be if they are coupled with an EHR that creates that uh, original log. Um, but typically, solutions that take that original log as a secondary product and do analysis and reporting and alerting are not considered a part of uh, an organic uh, EHR, if you will, and don't meet the criteria for certification and therefore are not certified individually. But that is one of the things that is being discussed uh, for uh, meaningful use uh, stage two and stage three requirements. Uh, because everybody understands that once you have dealt with the EHR, you still have to deal with all of the other systems uh, that communicate with uh, and to uh, the EHR, and you're going to have to have some level of enterprise uh, log management and, and analysis and reporting capability. Um, and so there is, right now, there is a discussion around uh, certification of other products either coupled with uh, an EHR uh, in terms of this, this capability or creating a new uh, certification standard for products that facilitate some core uh, measure or core responsibility uh, of the EHR. And uh, so we'll just have to stay tuned to see how that how that turns out. But as it stands today, the answer would be no. And, and Mac, if I may, like I'd like to add a little bit to that response as well. Uh, so in healthcare, you know, as Mac pointed out, the answer is no. But there are other industries that do require us uh, to certify. And for example, you know, our tools are being heavily used in the military as well and a FIP certification. So we, our tools have a FIPS level two certification and a common criteria EAL level three certification. These are very high level certifications, uh, very hard to get, uh, very time consuming, but this is in an assurance for the end user that the devices that are collecting and processing all this uh, security information from all the logs, now it's all in one central repository, that information is indeed safe. Uh, the other requirement that usually comes up and people talk about is the chain of custody of events. So how are you handling those logs? Can I use them to prove it in court? Uh, will they hold or not? And uh, well, there's no requirement around that, but uh, almost all the uh, vendors out there, uh, 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 even though they have not been through a certification process, they do comply with other standards like NIST uh, and follow a process that is highly recommended. All right. Uh, does S E does S I E M integrate with EHR privacy solutions like Fair Warning? Yes. Uh, uh, go ahead, Mac. No, no, I was going to say I'll, I'll let you go ahead and answer that, Mel. But, but <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. The answer is yes, and uh, we actually do integrate with Fair Warning right out of the box. Okay. Uh, accounting and disclosures rule, what will be added to monitor and report on when a patient asks for an accounting of uh, who has seen their record? So um, I'm not quite uh, uh, clear on exactly what the, all the elements will be, but what we have seen uh, of the accounting and disclosure rule uh, as it was being developed uh, last year, and I had the opportunity to participate in some of those uh, conversations uh, with folks at OCR and other folks who were working on that, um, there will be very specific elements that have to be uh, reported on, monitored and, and reported on. And But I think one of the major uh, changes that we're going to see in the accounting for disclosures and rule, assuming it doesn't change when it comes out, um, is that we are going to have, have responsibility for reporting when somebody has simply viewed a record which is different than what we used, we used to have to do under the HIPAA rule. So it's not just the old uh, changes, additions, deletes, modifications, uh, creations, et cetera, um, but it's going to be a more complete list of, of um, ac actions, if you will, uh, that have to be collected on and reported uh, to, to include 
simple viewing of a patient's record. All right. And, uh, we are past the top of the hour. Maybe we have time for one more. Uh, hopefully it's not too big of a question, but will ICD-10 codes work within the system as well? Yes, they will. You handle that one. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, yes, yes, they will. And uh, to make it easier for the end users, uh, for content leak monitoring especially, uh, we do provide a dictionary that comes with the product, with all the ICD-9 codes. Okay. All right. Well, uh, that does conclude our presentation for today. And just one more time, that you can access these slides as a PDF at nitrosecurity.com slash webcast. And we'll send a full archive to all attendees in the next few business days. And thank you all for joining us today. This concludes our presentation.